So right, so I'll start now um, with the name of letting Elsa um, actually give the interest stuff at five past three. So just to introduce, you see the talk here um, of Elsa's talk. This talk's been given as part of the Archer virtual tutorial uh, series, which run uh, typically once a month at the same time slot, 3 p.m. That's British time um, on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, just a sl slight background, Elsa was, if you saw in some of the published emails, Elsa was visiting EPCC at the end of January, funded by um, an EPSERC uh, grant to establish collaborations between uh, US and UK uh, research software engineers. And we thought that as part of that, it would be good for her to talk about the work she's been doing to the UK community. And we thought the best way to do that was a, a virtual seminar or webinar. And I think that's been justified because uh, uh, 35 attendees or whatever is the, is the highest I've ever seen for one of these events. So I'm very pleased that this that this is working out. So I'll stop wittering on about the weather and the background and I'll pass you over to Elsa uh, to talk about state of the art IO tools. Uh, just to briefly, if you want to ask questions, you can ask at any time, but it's probably best to use text chat. We get the notification. So if people start using audio, that's okay, but it can be a bit a bit disruptive. It's up to you, but I think recommend text chat. There's a, a chat box at the bottom left. You, if you if you type into that, we'll get a notification and we can try and answer. We'll have questions at the end, but if you have a burning question during the talk, please feel free to type that in. And I will finally shut up now. Over to Elsa. Thanks, David. Yeah, I have about 40 slides or so, um, and I'm willing to take questions anytime. I'll go pretty quickly, but hopefully, um, you find it interesting. So I'm just going to start with some of the motivating examples that motivate me as someone who works and focuses on I.O. and some of the questions that I hear from applications and applications want answered and hopefully I can get everyone thinking um, about I.O. early in the game or you know if you have an application running and you think you could get better performance, I.O. is a great place to look. And then I'll move on to talk about why I.O. is so tricky, um, some of the new technologies that are coming online, and finally I'll kind of do some deep dives into a few of the applications that I work on uh, to help improve I.O. and uh, improve application I.O. performance. So here at uh, Lawrence Livermore, we're getting a new supercomputer and it's going to have GPUs in it. So if we have a simulation that runs 10 time cycles and then dumps some data shown in the little gray arrows. So they do 10 regular cycles, they dump some I.O. back to compute, do some more simulation, dump some I.O. When they move to GPUs, all of a sudden the time taken to do 10 simulation cycles gets a lot smaller and by contrast the I.O. seems a lot longer. It no longer takes one-tenth of the time to do, uh, it's not equivalent to one cycle of simulation time. I.O. suddenly takes five or 10 equivalent simulation cycles. Even though I.O. performance hasn't changed, from the application perspective, I.O. is just too much time. Applications don't want I.O. taking up, you know, 50, 60% of their compute time. They want to be doing simulations most of that time. So as Compute performance increases as we get better machines, as we port to GPUs, I.O. must be reevaluated. Even if you get a new supercomputer with new, bigger, faster, better I.O. subsystems, I.O. is not getting as good as, good as fast as compute performance. So these are the typical questions I hear from applications. How good is our I.O. right now? We don't even have a clue. Are we doing good or bad compared to everybody else? Which parameters in my application do I need to set so that I can get the best I.O. performance? And finally, if I am getting a new supercomputer, maybe there's some new storage tiers or new shiny knobs or something, how do we use those new tiers? How do we use new uh, technologies that are coming online? So first question, where do we fall in the I.O. envelope? If you know the peak I.O. performance of your system, so hopefully someone, when they bought the system, tested how fast the I.O. can go, and you know the current application performance, which means somebody profiled your current application, and you know the I.O. pattern, so you know what type of I.O., 
how many files they're trying to write, the general gist of what the application is doing, maybe you need some other details, then you can begin to answer where is the application uh, doing the right things or doing the wrong things? What gains can be made to get closer to that peak? So you can use IOR and MD test to measure some of those pure system peaks or an IO specific proxy application. But then you really have to get down in the weeds and do a lot of work. You have to look at the exact application, figure out what it's doing. Is it using some other library maybe? Um, why you have to do a lot of correlation to understand why this application isn't getting, you know, perfect advertised numbers of peak performance. The unposed questions here are, what is the point of this I.O. in the application? Are they trying to write the right things? Is the I.O. they're doing really contributing to science? Is there a more efficient way to do this I.O.? With the bigger, better supercomputer, can you do some in situ analysis to decrease the amount of I.O. you have to do? So these are really high level questions. So when an application asks, how do we do better with I.O.? I ask, what are you doing already? And if they don't know the answer, then we have to really start to get on the same page and really work together to understand um, how to improve. Next question, which parameters can I tweak to achieve better performance? So assuming the IO I, I'm doing has to be done, this is how I'm getting science out of my simulation, we have to do this IO, what's the best way to do it? So again, hopefully you, your system admin or someone interested has tested the system and knows kind of the peak performance that an application should be able to achieve. Now that you've worked with the application, maybe you understand their IO pattern and what they're doing. Now we can go back and say, what file system settings can we tune? Specifically in the case of Luster, can we tune the striping? Can we turn the stripe count up or down? Is there some other bottleneck in the system? Is there a network bottleneck or a metadata bottleneck or file locking? What parameters are, what bottlenecks are we seeing that we can maybe change something small to, to improve them? So how do you do this? You, you hire a human. Uh, there's no current um, tool or application or proxy or anything available to really answer some of these questions, to look at what an application is doing and understand which parameters to tweak to improve performance. So you can run the validation of simulation models with counters or, you know, do some sort of proxy app and understand what a proxy app is doing, but it's, it's much harder to do for every single application an analysis. Here some of the unposed questions are, can we create tools that detect some of these things at a lower level? Can the file system luster, say, recognize when an application is trying to thrash a lock or communicate some of the bottleneck details back up the stack so that the application recognizes easier um, when it's hitting some of these bottlenecks? Can the file system maybe tune itself during a workload and recognize if one huge file is striped on a single disk and maybe automatically do some dynamic striping. Um, and how does this information, some of the, the tunable parameters that we want in file systems, how can this drive uh, future procurements and our future uh, systems? So these questions are really low level, down in the file system, down in the system weeds, and they kind of start to stretch up to the application. So it's low-level and inter-level questions. Final question is, once we get a super, a new supercomputer with a shiny new file system, how do we best use new storage tiers or new file system technologies? So we need to do science. We need to do bigger, better science all the time. So let's get bigger, better computers, bigger, better file systems. Now we have to use them efficiently. So what are our system limitations that, you know, where can we do the most science, but, you know, you can't do everything you want. So the answer for new systems is often which I.O. patterns fit best for this new system. And if there's some sort of resiliency need, how do we make sure that the I.O. and the 
the even the scientific work that gets done uh, stays achieved. You know, if your system is crashing all the time, you need some resiliency. You need to make sure that any work you do do um, sticks around. So some examples of this are defensive I/O. So you do uh, checkpointing, sort of at an optimal checkpoint interval. So understanding. Um, how often or how frequently a system crashes means kind of correlates to how frequently you should do a checkpoint. Um, SCR is a uh, scalable checkpoint restart system. So understanding uh, using tools that exist to do some of these checkpoint restart operations um, configured for your particular system are also useful. And then finally, if you just need to get more data out of your system, um, you can use compression, even lossy compression. If you're generating tons of um, data and all you need to do is create a movie that the scientists can look and analyze that movie, maybe you don't need every single bit of your data. So using some compression tools to decrease the I.O. workload um, to improve throughput. Some of these unposed questions typically at procurement time are how is the resource schedulers and applications and all the different pieces of the system going to interact? Can the resource scheduler be smart, be more made more aware, meaning not only do the applications have to understand that the resource scheduler needs more details from their job and what they're intending to do, um, then the resource scheduler can make better decisions. And Finally, what is the scientific need? How much precision is needed? And what workflows or other data movement and management tools can we use? So these are really full stack questions. When you throw in a new tier of storage, you need to understand how that has ripple effects kind of up and down the full stack. So as an IO person, uh, when I hear some of these questions, the first thing I want to do is go in and measure I.O. performance. I want to benchmark um, our current system, benchmark new systems, understand how it's uh, going to perform. I want to profile an application if I'm working with an application team. And then finally, I want to use proxy apps that I have so that I don't always have to run the big, you know, super uh, physics simulations. I can just run a proxy app that focuses on I.O. and gets to exactly what I'm looking for. So for benchmarking, we have many, many, many POSIX interface uh, IO benchmark tools. IOR and MD tests are sort of the um, most popular out in the community. Bench IO is developed at EPP, EPCC. And then there's a whole bunch, kind of every grad student who starts getting into IO develops their own little benchmark tool and writes a paper and um, some are better supported than others. So most of these tests POSIX, some test MPIO. None of them test HDF5. Uh, well, BenchIO does. Most of them uh, ignore higher level uh, libraries, which are what applications typically use. So it, it's sometimes hard to understand why an application performance might not be doing as well as your benchmark if your benchmark is doing I.O. completely differently. Profiling tools, we have Darshan and Vampir. Darshan is uh, developed at Argonne National Lab. It's very popular and many uh, supercomputer centers just automatically put it on all your job, on all your jobs and it just has simple counters. So Darshan will count how many file opens your job did during an allocation, how many file closes, how many bytes did it write on average. It does a lot of really great profiling um, operations and makes it easy for applications to see exactly what, what they've been doing for every job. So some centers uh, have that automatically set up, which is great. BAMP here is a trace analysis tool and is uh, understand some of the IO traces, IO trace formats. Then we get into proxy applications. So hack IO or generic IO is the proxy app for hack. If that's an EPC, 
ECP, the Exascale Computing Project here in the US. Uh, so HACK is an ECP project um, that does some cool physics. And it was really great that they were able to kind of rip out the physics parts and save the IO so that the IO community can start to understand what is their IO pattern. If your IO pattern isn't exactly like HACK, you should think about writing a proxy application so that the IO community can start to understand what your IO pattern is like and how uh, your IO pattern can be changed or improved or how we can improve other tools uh, to match your IO. So Maxio, I'll get into a little bit, is developed at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and that's to match some of the, the simulation uh, codes that we have here. So Maxio has a high level of abstraction of IO, so it's at the physics level. It can use any of the IO middlewares, uh, HDF5, uh, NetCDF, I think I have a list here, Silo, Typhoon IO, which I know is used at AWE. Um, so it can use any of these uh, plugins to kind of push through uh, physics mesh data. So the user, if you're really familiar with physics, uh, you can set up your meshes, 1D, 2D, 3D, rectilinear, stuff like that. I'm not a physicist, I don't know what they do. They have tons of variables. You can really represent the physics that you're simulating and then just dump it through the IO middleware, the IO library. And so without the simulation part, you can start to understand how the IO from a simulation application um, performs. So we can use Maxio. Maxio is open source. I know often some of these uh, simulation physics uh, applications are not open source, um, but Maxio is for those. Um, Maxio also has the ability to change your, your I.O. pattern. So it can do a file per process. It can do a single huge shared file, or it can do this middle ground where you have M files for N processes. And you can really use Maxio to start to play around with, are we doing the best I.O. for this system? If I change it to 10 processes and two files, do I get slightly better or worse performance? How can I tweak Maxio, see the IO performance change, and then go back and redevelop some pieces of my application? So by, by using Maxio to play around with IO patterns, you can start to see how you can improve performance for your own application. Again, Maxio supports many of these uh, third-party libraries. So why is IO so complicated? It, it seems like at first glance it should be pretty easy. I have data in the computer and I just need data down on disk. Just put it over there. What's in the way? Well, there's all these other things in the way. You have your application, and I mentioned already you might be using some other IO libraries like HDF5 and um, NetCDF. Then you talk, those libraries talk to a Lustre client. Luster is sitting in Linux, going, sending out to OSTs in a Linux virtual file system. Uh, those storage targets are running up their own file system. We run ZFS at uh, Livermore. Within the disk, you've got a buffer cache. You got an IO scheduler. You got some redundancy mechanisms, and maybe finally at the end of the day, you're down on spinning disk. Again, the, the IO middleware can be any number of applications. So at the end of the day, most end up being straight up POSIX. Um, so even though the application doesn't have to ever do an F open, it's writing POSIX all day. POSIX was not designed for parallel IO. POSIX was designed for serial synchronous IO. And these other layers kind of squiggle around that. And then I mentioned that maybe the application has some sort of uh, MPI rank to number of files mapping. So you can do again, single shared file, all MPI ranks writing into a single file, 
or multiple files or one file for per MPI rank, all sorts of options there. Finally, we're getting some brand new, uh, super exciting burst buffer uh, technologies. So, you know, if you can't get the performance with the system you have, just put another layer in. Um, so these are the burst buffer technologies that I'm most familiar with. We have kind of the node local um, IBM burst buffer. So this is every single node in your computer just gets an extra SSD slapped on. Um, which is nice because it scales as you scale up the number of nodes, um, but has other problems. Uh, the other type or style of burst buffer technology is to create data warp. Um, so this is available at uh, Los Alamos here in the US or NERSC, um, or I'm sure some other Cray machines have it. So this is sort of a big chunk of storage that is really sitting within the computer so it's really fast for the compute nodes to talk to, um, but it's not one per node. It's just for the whole machine kind of in the network, um, some IO or some uh, special file system uh, nodes. So how can we use, you know, this kind of brand new application, this brand new layer um, for the IO that we're already doing? So here's a use case that uh, we see from, particularly from node local, but for most burst buffers, is we have data we know we're going to use within our job. Now, the movement of that data can be totally decoupled from the compute usage. So you can pre-stage your data into the burst buffer before you even turn on a single compute node, which most of our users like, since we usually charge them per compute cycle. So there's no need to wait for data to move while burning up time on your CPUs. Then with this burst buffer, during your compute usage, during your simulation, you have quicker, faster, lower latency access to this burst buffer tier. So your job can uh, be using the burst buffer. And then finally, when you're done with your compute, you can slowly in the background drain some of the data out from your burst buffer to the parallel file system to your larger luster. And again, this is decoupled from the compute usage, which means you're kind of saving money, but still getting science done. Some of the downsides of this, it really relies heavily on the integration with the resource manager. It also means that users need to recognize that data movement is a cost and takes time. So even if they want to start computing right now, it might be more efficient if they waited until their data was available. Um, getting into machine global versus the node local burst buffer types, that can have uh, tweaks, tricks here. There can be problems with implementation. And it doesn't address any uh, inter-job data movement. So if you have two or three jobs that are going to be using the same data, this use case where you pre-stage, use, and then post-stage flush your data uh, doesn't work. You kind of want to leave the data in the burst buffer for a while and then come back, use it, use it for a couple more jobs, a couple more allocations before finally telling the resource scheduler, go ahead, I don't need it anymore. So it really relies on deep integration with the resource uh, scheduler and the users knowing what their full-on system workflow is and recognizing that data movement takes time and they need to be uh, okay with that and patient. Um, what I notice most from this sort of use case is that it's perfect for checkpoint restart, particularly where you have a long-running simulation if you have an old pre-existing checkpoint, you wanna make sure that checkpoint is available so that you can start up your simulation from the existing checkpoint, run your simulation for a while, create checkpoint files as you need them, and then finally, when your simulation is over, take that very final checkpoint, flush it down to the parallel file system to come back later another day. Um, so this is where SCR comes in. SCR, again, is a scalable checkpoint restart library. It's available on GitHub. 
um, and developed at Lawrence Livermore. And the whole goal of SCR is to take advantage of the system storage hierarchies. So if your application is already doing uh, checkpoint restart, SCR is perfect for you because you can just drop SCR in and you don't even need to uh, understand what the storage hierarchies are. Tell your system administrator you want to use SCR and they can work with us to configure the to create a correct configuration so that your application is automatically aware of the different storage hierarchies and can take advantage of them. So SCR does some file movement between the storage layers. So if your application will simply write to the fastest layer and then go back to doing compute while SCR figures out how to move the data. And then SCR has some data redundancy operations. So if you have, um, if one of the nodes in your job goes down or there's some corruption of one of your uh, files in your checkpoint, SCR does some redundancy operations so that you can rebuild those files um, and restart right from there. No need to start from an older checkpoint. Or if for whatever reason the most recent checkpoint can't be rebuilt, SCR will tell the application uh, to fall back to an older checkpoint. So SCR consists of three components. A library um, that you uh, load into your application, some scripts that you run, that you use to run your application, so that way SCR can work with the resource manager and do some smart things, making sure that the, you know, if your job allocation is running out of time, make sure that the latest checkpoint is getting flushed or is moved to the parallel file system. And then finally, configuration files. So this is where SCR's uh, portability comes in because you can have per system configurations that the applications can either all use the same one or share so that you're using those available storage hierarchies most efficiently. So talking a little bit more about the backend library, um, this library just redirects application files. So when an application says, hey, I'm trying to write checkpoint one down to the parallel file system. SCR says, okay, write checkpoint one, but here, let's write it in the RAM disk, it'll be a lot faster, and then I'll move it down to the parallel file system later. Um, you can use either synchronous or asynchronous flush operations, um, particularly with the new burst buffer technologies, some of them have vendor specific um, asynchronous APIs, so SCR can take advantage of those. Um, I already talked about SCR applies a redundancy across the files that your application does write to make sure that uh, they can be rebuilt. And it supports both checkpoint data and output data. So many applications don't differentiate between checkpoint and output, um, but you should. So when you do write those output data, so output data is like maybe the frame of the video, that would be good. Uh, that would be good output data. So it doesn't have every single bit of memory like a checkpoint might, but it does have data that you need to persist forever um, for your application. Um, from the front end, SCR does a few things. Using the scripts, it will locate the most recent checkpoint and fetch it into your uh, compute allocation or burst buffer for restart. Um, while your job is running, SCR will detect system crashes, node crashes, some failures, and if your MPI just errors out for whatever reason, SCR will be kind of running on top of that and say, okay, let's go ahead and restart that MPI. Let's just try again and see what's going on. Uh, during execution, while your job is, while your application is running simulations, um, SCR will manage the data sets. So if you've written two checkpoints into the burst buffer, well, you, maybe you don't need that older checkpoint and SCR can go ahead and get rid of that. Or maybe it can, or it will detect that maybe your job allocation is ending soon. So the latest checkpoint needs to get down to the parallel file system immediately. And um, finally, we're working again with some of these burst buffer specific vendor APIs. Um, and rescore scheduler integrations to handle the pre-stage and post-stage data movement. 
so that you can decouple your compute from your data movement. Um, finally, the third piece of SCR is its configurations. So here's where you tell SCR, these are the levels of the file system. Here's the hierarchy. Um, here's all the different modes or groups of failure. Um, so at Livermore, we would have two nodes on a single power strip so or a single um, plug. So if for whatever reason, uh, the plug or power went out at that one spot, both of those nodes would go down. So SCR would just recognize, okay, the, these nodes shouldn't be in the same redundancy group because we're most likely to lose them at the same time. Um, and the, the last part of these configurations are application specific configurations. So each application can say, I need to checkpoint this frequently. I shouldn't save all of my checkpoints, but I do want to save every fifth one, which means that SCR will make sure that every fifth checkpoint gets written down to the parallel file system and other uh, details. This is uh, through these configuration files, this is where SCR is really machine portable. So once you have SCR into your application, uh, then you can go from the Cray Data Warp technology to the IBM Burst Buffer technology to other technologies um, without kind of the headache of reintegrating uh, new uh, details. Um, I mentioned the Exascale Computing Project. SCR is, and the SCR team is part of the Veloci project. So if you don't have checkpointing, in your code already, you can look at FTI, which is a variable-based checkpointing scheme. Um, so if you already have checkpointing, uh, use SCR. It's a pretty easy to integrate. If you don't, um, you can mark variables as I need to checkpoint this variable, um, mark it with the FTI library, and FTI will um, kind of save it when it comes time to checkpoint. Um, so both FTI and SCR, the best pieces of each, are uh, getting combined into the Veloci project. Um, another project I think the community should be aware about is Unify CR. So this is a user-level file system that per compute allocation, per job allocation, creates a shared namespace across these node local burst buffers. So it can do some of the smart metadata operations when you have a distributed kind of node local burst buffer um, and make it appear as if it is one unified namespace. So you could write a single shared file to the node local burst buffers and unify with CR would make sure that everything works. Another project is uh, MPI file utils. It's available on GitHub and it basically takes some of your favorite Unix utilities like CP, RM, and makes them available in parallel. So what you do is you create a job allocation to run your uh, DCP, and it will utilize multiple MPI ranks, multiple threads, to do those file copies, file deletes, file movements, broadcasts, um, many more options. They have a ton of utilities out on GitHub. Um, so as you're dealing with kind of these movement of large data sets, large files through the storage tier, you can use some of these utilities. Finally, I want to mention the IO500. Um, so everyone has seen those top 500 charts and seen how much performance has changed since the 80s. We don't have that sort of image for IO. We don't understand how IO or file systems have grown or changed. Um, throughout the last two years even. So the IO500 is an effort uh, to remedy that and start collecting data about file systems, storage systems um, around the world. So that's available at the Virtual Institute for IO, vi4io.org. Um, and it uses IOR and MD test and a find operation to really understand where your file system gets performance. Is it really good for metadata? Is it really good for straight up bandwidth? 
or is it good for indexing your files and making those, you know, searching through your files for the users? Um, so you can learn more um, online. And that's all I have. So thank you very much. Um, we'll take questions. So uh, great, thanks a lot, Elsa. That was excellent. Um, um, I just noticed that Wadud answered asked a question quite early on, but it appeared in the same box as another um, comment from him. So I didn't see it. He was asking, "What is a co situ process?" I don't know if you saw that at the time. I oh, think it was quite sorry. early on. Sorry, I should have noticed it at the time, but it, I, it, the format meant I didn't notice it. Yeah. So co situ processes are just um, similar to in situ processes. If you have maybe a single job allocation, but two separate MPI applications running within it, where one um, MPI group or application is doing analysis and another application is generating data. Um, similar to in situ or in transit analysis, co-situ is just two applications that are somewhat decoupled, but someone have this, but have this data dependency on them, between them. Okay, so I guess that could either be, two dependent PBS jobs, or you could, on Arch, you could just run two jobs consecutive in the same PBS script, I guess, that would be the, the sort of naivest way of, of, of setting that up. Or, or you could um, start up a single MPI job that then uh, cuts Com World in half, and you have kind of two halves that operate in concert. They're okay. decoupled, oh, yeah. and yet they create, you know, move data back and forth. Great. So, um, Please ask questions. I said, but the easiest thing to do is to type into the into the chat window, or you can try audio if you want. But the chat window seems to work quite well. Um, I mean, I had a couple of questions I just wanted to ask, but I really wanted to open up to people um, online first. Um, if there were any any questions about um, specific examples, the question they had, or more general questions about. Uh, the technologies and tools that else is. So um, Peter's asking there. So can you see these um, these questions, else? I know it depends somewhat on how it's set up locally. Yep, yep, I can see them. I'll read it out just for the sake of the of the of the track. Does SCR replace say AD, HDF5 or work with it? Is his question. So SCR works with HDF5. So when the application says I'm going to write this file, you know my data dot h5. SER just does some path manipulation and says store it here in the first buffer first before moving it down to the parallel file system. So doesn't replace anything. Are operating systems getting better at I.O. is the next question. Should SCR really be part of the operating system? Um, that is a very interesting question. Um, I think that um, there are some improvements being made to I.O., but unfortunately, many people, m myself included, are tied to POSIX, and POSIX is often the limitation. Uh, scientists want to be able to go in and LS their files and see what's happening. Um, they want to create their own data, you know, directories and store files there. And as long as people are thinking in this POSIX manner, we can't get rid of it. So you can't change the operation operating system really away from, um, from POSIX. So there are new technologies to do object stores. Um, and that would be one way to integrate some of this stuff at an operating system level. Um, but it is a really totally new paradigm for our users. Um, that's very difficult. And particularly in the, the SCR case, I think, I don't think it saves anyone time to kind of hide away all the different levels of storage. I know that people often don't want to think about it, but using storage costs money. Um, sometimes more than compute, even though we don't, we often don't charge for storage. Um, so uh, scientists, people really need to think about where is my data, how long should it persist, should it be backed up, 
how am I going to use it? How fast do I need it to be available to compute? Um, they have to think about these questions. Um, they can't be abstracted away. Does that answer your question? Thank you. So I, uh, just Dave, just say I've been teaching sort of parallel I/O to to our MSc students, and and someone asked a similar question um, at the talk, and um, well, I have been asked a question before. I think that the, the way that things like Lustre work, which are very complicated, is that there are layers on top of standard, you know, well, currently Linux I/O, you know, right at the bottom there are lots of individual Linux file systems that really don't know anything about the parallel I/O, and um, and higher up. Um, and higher up, it's Luster that splits the file up into lots of different pieces, allocates them to different disks to get parallel I/O. But that's all done in the Luster space, and, and 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 Linux takes over after that. So Linux is responsible for writing this portion of a file to a local file system on a local disk. So there's kind of a, you know sort of what you'd say separation of concerns there, that the Linux file system at the bottom doesn't really know it's doing parallel I/O. That's my naive understanding of the way things work anyway. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Is that Luster is just a coordinator and just sends data to different pieces of a Linux um, system. You just asked. Uh, you said the SCR can redirect application files. How transparent is that? Um, so it's very transparent application. So but sometimes not very transparent to the users. Um, so how it works is that you tell SCR you're going to do a checkpoint and you say here I want to checkpoint and here's my full path. I want to go to slash luster slash checkpoint one dot text or whatever. And SCR says, okay, I know you want to, we'll call this file the slash luster slash checkpoint, but here, right to slash um, temp slash checkpoint. So the application knows right away that it's writing to slash temp, even though the user who's run the application uh, isn't so aware of that. So, but the user can configure SCR to say, don't use slash temp ever, only use slash burst buffer, uh, um, or only use slash luster. So SCR. It's fully configurable, so you should know at all times where your files are going. Um, but it does kind of do this redirection. I hope that answers your question. There's also a question from Mark. Are burst buffers only an advantage if the I.O. load is low or moderate? I guess it's the same question as, you know, are caches any use if your data set is huge? <laughs> Um, no, I think burst buffers are most advantageous when the I.O. load is very high because they often have higher bandwidth and lower latency. Um, so your application can more quickly get back to uh, doing work. So I, I think burst buffers are most advantageous in high I.O. Um, you know, if you ever have I.O. that's holding up your application from doing compute, uh, you want it done faster, and a burst buffer will be faster than the parallel file system in most cases. And then if you can, you know, utilize some uh, resource scheduler integration, do some other tweaks, uh, you can get even better performance on your overall scientific application, not just um, writing data. So I just noticed that Anton asked a supplementary question. So if, if people do more than one question at once, it appears in the same bubble, which is why I hadn't noticed. He was asking if people at um, Lawrence Livermore use co arrays and when they use, oh, how do they do co array IOs? So that's Fortran co, co arrays. I, I'm, I don't know Fortran. <laughs> okay, so you've not been, you, I don't you haven't know. any. Right. So if this is the Anton, who I think it is, we worked together a while back to put um, MPIIO interfaced into core arrays, but um, that's that's jumping out. Yeah, that's jumping out of the core array model. Um, that is that's which is reasonably clean, but um, um, 
Yeah, I know that Fortran I.O. can be very tricky sometimes. Um, but I, yeah, I think we're using not co-arrays in our Fortran codes as far as I know. But So Harvey's asking the IO500 rates um, performance on bandwidth and not metadata. Um, do you know how many applications would rather actually have met better metadata metadata performance? You mentioned that as being potential limiting factor in, in your mm -hmm. in your introductory slides. Um, so the IO500 does a, a weighted score between bandwidth and metadata, and yeah, those are the top five right now. And Bandwidth is clearly uh, weighted much higher. Um, there are some applications where metadata uh, can really be limiting. Um, if you need to create many files, if you need to access your files, um, stat your files. If you're using Python, Python will stat the heck out of your uh, parallel file system. So. Understanding the metadata performance of the backing file system is really important. Um, often it's not the heaviest weighted item uh, like bandwidth because we really just care about moving data, but it can be a big bottleneck. So making sure that metadata isn't a huge bottleneck is important. Mark's come up with a follow-up comment. Say what I meant was, was if the total I/O um, total load on the system is low or moderate, the staging can be done while other users are not doing I/O. Um, so I wonder if he, I think he's saying there that maybe the one model is that if if there's low low or moderate I/O uses, then that the burst buffers can effectively um, smooth out. I guess yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, completely can get, I mean that each user gets sort of uh, maximum IO performance um, <clears throat> I don't know what PASOP policies I guess one of the critical things is what are the policies for moving from the burst buffers to the to the actual end file system I don't know what the um, if that's done as soon as possible or a job shut down or is it sort of deferred until is it, is, it, is it decided based on any kind of load measures or is it just done when it's um, needed? So it can be integrated into the um, scheduler to make the scheduler do it. Um, but it depends, again, on the setup and the technology and the, the supercomputing center who's running that. Um, so if the total load, our burst buffer is only advantageous if the total load, IO load on the system is low to moderate. So again, I think burst buffers are most advantageous when the load is high, um, particularly in the node local case, no longer is your node local storage device a shared resource. Unlike the parallel file system where you could be sharing it with whoever, um, a node local burst buffer is you are the only person getting in your way of getting the full performance there. For staging, um, if IO is high, um, kind of throughout your whole system, if there's a high load of IO um, and the staging has been integrated with your scheduler, uh, it would be very advantageous to take advantage. Uh, to, to use the kind of scheduler staging so that you can make sure that your compute does not start until your data has been staged, no matter how long that staging takes. So even if the, so if the IO load is very high, um, you can say, don't start spending money until I know my data is going to be available. Is, I'm not sure if that answers the question or gives a perspective. So we're coming towards the end of the of the session. Um, that was really great, Elsa. Thanks for for giving us that overview. A couple of people asked about the the presentation. We'll um, 
we'll definitely have the presentation uh, and we'll have the slides available on the website reasonably shortly um, um, definitely uh, by, by hopefully by next week um, I'd just like to say that um, I mean I think it's really good time to be thinking about IO. I think I mean one of the crucial comments that Elsa made was right at the start saying that you know everyone everyone's focused on faster and faster performance of, of, on the compute side but you know that just means that the IO um, becomes becomes even if IO wasn't a factor before it does be, become a factor now and that's really just Andar's law but applied applied to the IO overhead so I think if people are looking at you know at, at moving to, to, to you know Bigger, bigger simulations in terms of scale, or, or moving on to faster computers. They, you know, you need to st start understanding now what your I/O fraction is. And if it's small, that's fine. But if it's starting to be, you know, 10% at the moment, then that's going to hit you very soon. And that's definitely something we saw in Archer. I mean, I've been involved in the national services for for a long time now, and Archer was really. I knew nothing about parallel file systems or parallel I/O before Archer, but when Archer came on, it, it had reached that threshold where a large number of applications had gone from being not dominated to, to IO by being dominated by to IO because Archer was so much, was with that factor two or three uh, per node faster than, than Hector had been. And I think it's definitely worth something looking at in advance because if you, if, you, if you find it out after the fact, it can be quite painful. And there's a lot of technologies out there. And so please get in touch with, if you're a UK user or an Archer user, Feel free to get in touch with the help desk, um, and we can maybe get you give you advice about IO um, in advance rather than than waiting for it to bite you. But again, if there's no more uh, questions, I'd just really like to thank Elsa for getting up so early on uh, her side of the pond. I guess it was seven a.m. Um, that you that you got up, um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, well, thank you for having me. Um, it was really really great questions and great interaction. Um, so it's a good way so, to yeah. start my day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, brilliant. Okay, so thanks again. And um, hopefully we'll be able to collaborate on this more in the future. Yep. Yeah. Feel free off. to get in touch, I guess, with David. Or, um, if you have more questions, these slides will definitely be available. So, right. Thank you, everybody. Okay, and have a good day, Elsa, in the warm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> be safe in the snow. <laughs> bye. All right, Thanks, Elsa. Bye bye. Thank you.